So I thought I'd show you one of my uh, latest old computers. Latest old? Well, you, you get the idea. Um, it's quite a small one this time. It's just down there. So you sent me a picture of this, and to me it looked just like a tower computer, but perhaps if you stand next to it we'll get a sense of the actual scale of it. I mean, if I just sit on it. Pretty large, isn't it? <laughs> Fantastic. So tell us about it. What is it? So this is actually one of the Nottingham's Computer Science Department's old servers. It's been sitting in a cupboard, but it's a Sun 3160, which is a Sun Microsystems workstation from the late 80s. So it's a desk size model, and rather nicely, if I move the cables out of the way, it slides in up against the desk at exactly the right height. So I, I believe one of the other ones ended up its life as a coffee table for Dave Brailsford. We're going to see if we can get it working. Uh, there is a, a slight issue with the amount of dust inside it. If I switch it on, you can hear the noise it makes. Um, there's one red light here. Uh, I've got a serial link connecting it to it, and we can start to see the self-test come up on the computer here. Actually, this computer from about 93 is probably more powerful than that, although it doesn't quite have as much memory. So it's testing the RAM at the moment. So at the moment, I've not got it to do much more than this. So this is late 80s. If you look at the top, you can see the manufacturing thing. It says it was assembled 2nd of June 1986. 31 years old. Is it just coming up to its 31st birthday? It's coming up to its 31st birthday, so we thought we'd get it out of retirement and give it a new lease of life. Um, it sounds like the fans are clogged with something, and it won't boot past the memory test, so uh, we'll take it apart, see what's working, and see how it's actually fitted together. While you're doing that, I'm going to ask the uh, obvious question. There's a sticker on there that says Sheriff. What's that all about? That was just the name of the machine. The department at the time then liked to use uh, names based off Robin Hood. So we had Sheriff, we had Tuck, we had Robin, uh, and various other machines. There's a machine called Marion as well. The mail server was called Pat, and everyone in the UK will know why that is the case. So they look like they're kind of slide in, slide out cards on the Yep, so, this, so the way this machi these machines worked in those days, everything was on cards. It's still the case. In fact, if you go into a submarine or something or any sort of environment like that, you'll find very similar sorts of cards being used. It's what's called the VME bus. Um, it was a popular thing of Motorola at the time, but it enables you to sort of build the system up. You have a back plane at the back. You see those connectors along here and you just slide the cars into there and then they can all talk over the back plane to each other so you can configure the machine exactly as you need it. On this one, I've got the CPU card here on the left. Um, that's probably extra memory. And um, we'll have a look. That one's just a blanking plate. This one's an additional ethernet card. So it's got two ethernet connectors here. And if you look back at some of the network diagrams from the department at the time, you'll see it was used to link two separate ethernets together. I see you doing a bit of work, Steve, actually. <laughs> it's not what I normally do. I'm normally more software. But, uh, no, I like playing with hardware. So hopefully we should be able to pull this card out and without breaking anything. So this is just a blanking plate by the look of it. There's nothing on it. This is all um, sheet metal, so it's as heavy as, well, sheet metal. So you can pull the cards out. And here we have, whoops, what have we got here? I would say this is RAM. So you can see there, there we are, another Robin Hood name. Much, much RAM, two, so there's eight meg of RAM. I imagine this wasn't actually produced by Sun, this board. It's got a clear point name on the top, which I suspect is another company. So you've got your board with your RAM, and it all connects back over the back plane by these three connectors here. And these can carry the data signals and the address signals and the control signals from the CPU and the address. And so you could configure the machine as you liked. The difference now, of course, is that you have multiple layers. And this just seems to be a two layer PCB. I've already taken uh, photos of where all these boards went so we can put it back together in the right order. We got this one out. And again, I think this is just more RAM. This is just another does that say? 4 meg possibly, 2 meg, 8 meg, something along those lines. So I don't think you can see in now, we've now got the CPU card there, which has got its own memory on, and various other bits and pieces. 
So we've got an Ethernet port on here, some switches, some lights, video connector if you wanted to plug in a display, keyboard connector. There we are, that's that. That looks like an impressive bit of engineering. So there's the, uh, the back and showing all the connections. So what have we got on here? The first place to start is a CPU. This one's here. Uh, it's a 68020, which is a Motorola CPU. It's the same family of CPUs that were found in the Atari and the Amiga. And it was good because it was great for running Unix, which is what this machine used at the time. So it's a 68020. At the time, the Amigas, the Ataris, the Macintoshes, all 68000 based machines. This one was a later revision and so more powerful. We've also got a floating point code processor here. And then this looks like a boot ROM of some sort. So I'll have the BIOS equivalent or the boot ROM as it was called here. And you've got your network controller card there. Um, I wouldn't be too surprised if that's part of the network as well. And then you've got lots and lots of discrete logic chips around here to do things. And the occasional programmable logic array here. This one's labeled HAL. But, um, I don't think this is related, but how would have been built in a similar form? And then here we've got RAM. So the CPU board's got memory on it. I imagine there's what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. I imagine it's set up as parity RAM, which is why we've got more than sixteen there, and so on. And that would give you a base amount of memory, I imagine about four megabytes. Serial controller chip here, same one as used in the Macintosh. And so this is basically, this is enough to start the whole machine. There's the graphics cards on here and well. So you could build the machine completely out of this. And I think some of the other Sun machines made use of the same system. How we're talking to this, what we've got is a serial connection, which enables us to communicate to another machine. Now normally in the serial you'd either use the built-in graphics or you'd have used the dumb terminal. I'm actually connecting to a sort of Atari here and then just using on the screen a simple terminal program. So that's not doing anything more than echoing what's shown off this computer via the serial link. The most annoying thing about trying to get this working so far is that the connector used here is the opposite to what's used on a PC or an Atari. So I've had to get a gender changer to actually connect things together. That's been the most complicated thing so far. What happened to some? Sun. So Sun, it, they were started in the early 80s. They started producing Unix workstations based around the 68000. So the Sun one was the first. And then this was a bit later on. Um, they then developed their own CPU, the Spark chip. And throughout the 90s, if you wanted powerful sort of computers, you would buy Sun, made a lot of things. And then they produced a little program you may have heard of called Java, which of course became a reasonably popular operating, uh, not operating system, a reasonably popular virtual machine which you could compile and write programs towards. And then sort of about 2009, 2010, they were bought out by Oracle, who basically bought them because Solaris, the operating system they developed out of Unix to run these things, was probably the best one for running the Oracle database. And so they still, you can still get the des descendants of this to run Oracle databases, but that's about it. Ethernet card coming out now. So you can start to see um, how this is sort of fitting together. I think what you've got at the bottom, and I'm sort of half guessing here, is that this will sort of decide where in the computer's memory map the network card will be addressed. And so there's sort of control logic on there for doing various things. You've got some NOT gates and AND gates and so on in there. And then this bit here looks to be the actual network card itself. In fact, you can see, if you look carefully, it's on a separate card. And it's using an Intel LAN controller there. Well, it looks like they used to make those out of gold. That's fantastic, isn't it? Well, yes, yeah, so, so this is a ceramic chick package. I don't know quite why it's got the gold window on the top. Probably just keep the light out. But uh, the interesting thing is that it's got an AUI connector for connecting up to the Ethernet. It's not a sort of BNC connector or a RJ45 that we're used to these days. You would have a big cable that would drop out the ceiling that would connect onto this. And then inside the ceiling, you would have a huge thick cable that you'd plug that onto in the original instances. One last card to come out. How much do you think one of these would have been back in the day? Oh, several thousand, if not tens of thousands. So what have we got here? This is another cable card. This is hmm, interesting. Don't know what this one is. It's got a battery on it, so it's battery backed. Um, any clues as to what this one might be? The clock. Well, it could be a clock of some sort. Answers on a postcard too. You get a better view now of the back plane there. So these are all connected the same. 
And if you look very carefully at the left there, you'll see there's some resistor packs, the red things. So they, they'll be there to terminate the buses, just like you have to terminate the network connection. You, have, you want to terminate the buses to stop reflections of the signals and make sure things work as you'd expect. And then we've got two more boards here. Let's have them out and have a look. Is that one of those SCSI cards? So this is what we think might be a SCSI card. Um, XLC0, so that's probably, this is probably a Zylogix card actually. Little was another name of the machines we had. Well, like Little John? Absolutely. You can get in the Robin Hood naming convention. Here's another one. So what have we got here? It's another Zylogix disk controller of some sort. You've got the control chips in the middle, uh, and then the connectors. So a different sort of connector, different size. And then inside you can just see the back plane there. And the cards that we just looked at slide in and connect into that and everything then connects together. If you look here, you can see this is very simple. All the wires just connect all the pins together on each of these things. And the capacitors just provide a bit of smoothing on the power supply. Sun Microsystems Model 160. Oh, back plane. <laughs> descriptive, descriptive. This is where it gets interesting. It's a lot lighter to move now. You can have a look at the hard disks. This one's got a tape drive fitted here. We've got a hard disk here. So we've got a ribbon cable down here that we want to free and it seems that the front sort of comes off so with a bit of brute force and well intelligence but we get the front off so we can start to see a bit more disk drive configuration drive naught drive one fujitsu so it says micropolis inside so it may well have been upgraded since then on off switch for the power fuse by the look of it in fact here's the power supply here ETA power systems. And now we can see why this isn't sliding out. Because there's a cable here that goes under there. So you can see this is where the SCSI cable plugs in here onto the back plane there. Can you get that out? This is what ma makes me a computer file. Yeah. <laughs> Success! <laughs> back to the expert. So, with that connection apart, is that actually, can we actually get the whole thing out? Yeah, I think so. If I stick this down here, I can probably do it. Is there anything catching at that? It's very snug. It's against the fan assembly. So I mean, if go. we could slide towards the front, then that would be good. So we've got lots and lots of dust in here, but uh, we've got three things. We've got tape drive here, which of course you could use to load the media and things. Not sure we've got any of the media left. Um, and then you've got two hard drives. Uh, which is sort of common for the era. These worked very much like old floppy drives. You had two connectors, one that would control where the heads were positioned over the actual disk and one which would read the data across them. And then you would have a controller board inside your computer. What I think this machine's got is you've got two effectively SCSI controller boards here. And these allow you to talk to the drives, which are connected down here, using SCSI. The small computer systems interface. And it's a way of connecting hard drives. I've got to stop you there. Small computers, you say? Well, I've seen bigger ones. <laughs> as in, not huge room-sized ones. But it's a small computer systems interface. And the idea is it gives the drive some intelligence. So with these sort of cards, you have to physically drive them by saying, move this amount in once you're there, read the data, decode the data, and then you've got it. With these, you can say, get me this track and this sector from this track on this cylinder on this head and it'll go and get it and then send you the data. And it allows you to daisy chain lots of things together. So if you look at the cable, you see it's got multiple connectors on it. One went into here, and then the next one went into this one, and so on. So this is a SCSI controller card, which sort of translates the SCSI from the machine to the actual hard disks. So I think as we're going to go and blow the dust out of this, it might make sense that rather than getting a rather nice shirt covered, I am. Um, do my bit for science and actually put my old A-level lab coat on. Job, but someone's got to do it. 
So guys, just put in the CPU board and the SCSI board and we'll try booting up, check we haven't broken anything. But I suspect there'll be some remedial work before we can get everything going again. It's quite easy. The cards actually slide in on rails, which means we can just line them up and just push everything in. Get it lined up. And then everything just slides into place. So we've put the uh, CPU card back in and the SCSI card so we can access the disk. And we're going to try booting up and see what happens, see if we get any difference than what we had before. So let's apply the serial cable. We'll start it off in diagnostic mode again, so we've got that switched, and we just need some nice 240 volt hot power. Let's try turning it on. It is doing its self test. It's only found four megabytes now, that's good, because we only we took one of the cards out. So it should be faster testing the RAM, it's still just as noisy. Self test passed. I'll take to boot off the SCSI device. Device one, zero, see what happens. Nothing yet, but there's seven possible devices, so hopefully we can do it. Device not found, it's not device one. In the unlikely event that it does happen and it works, what, what would you expect to see? No idea, I've never got this far. <laughs> I'd like to see it say device not not found. This is directly adding content to my normal vision. The problem is the area that it has to add this content is really very narrow. I think it's the equivalent of a...